Canadian news could soon disappear from Canadians' Google searches and their Facebook and Instagram feeds. It's in response to Bill C-18 recently passed. A federal bill that will passed. require Google and Meta to pay media outlets for news content that they share or otherwise repurpose on their platforms has become law. And the tech giants... It's been a bad happy. few weeks for journalism in Canada. Bell Media announced it wants to get out of the local news business. It slashed multiple radio stations, laid off 1,300 staff. Rogers bought Shaw Communications and cut staff too. And now the Toronto Star and Post Media announced they're in talks to merge. And then just last week, Google and Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, said they will block Canadians from accessing links to Canadian news stories. And that will include the stories we publish here on the CJN. Actually, they've already started limiting who can see what we post on the CJN Daily's Facebook page. Now, experts say the big tech companies are playing hardball after the Canadian government passed Bill C-18 in June. It's called the Online News Act. Social media giants will have to pay millions into a special fund that would then be used to help save struggling Canadian newspapers. The social media companies have made billions by selling advertising all these years on their platforms around news stories when users scroll or click or search, and none of that money came back to Canada. So now Google and the others say the new law is unfair because they've actually helped news companies get their stories to wider audiences. Most Canadian news publishers, big and small, are worried. They say threats to block Canadians from seeing news articles could mean the death knell for their businesses. And we at the CJN also get a majority of our traffic from Google searches. Experts worry it means democracy is at risk because without access to reliable, and trustworthy news, how will Canadians know what's really going on? They're walking out of this country with billions of dollars and leaving us and saying, oh, well, if you don't do it our way, we're going to pull out. Well, to me, that is, that is a form of blackmail as far as I'm concerned. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Wednesday, July the 5th, 2023. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News sponsored by Metropia. <music> Now, in other countries like Australia and France and Spain, Google and Facebook and Instagram did block news access for some time when similar pieces of legislation were passed in those countries. Eventually, though, they relented. Here at home, Canadian media experts are watching what happens very carefully. And so to break it all down for you, we've got several guests on today's show, including Paul Godfrey, the chair of Post Media. He'll join me a bit later. But first... We welcome Yoni Goldstein, the CEO of the CJN, and Jeffrey Dvorkin. He's the former head of CBC Radio, former head of the U of T's Journalism School, former ombudsman at National Public Radio, and the author of a new book called Trusting the News in the Digital Age. Welcome both of you to the CJN Daily. Thank you. Good morning. I want to start off with a little bit of a background for our audience and our readers who maybe aren't so up on what Bill C-18 is. Maybe you'll start, Jeffrey. How did the Canadian media landscape and the business models get to the situation that Ottawa decided that it needed uh, an online news bill? A short version would be that the digital culture has hollowed out journalism at every level, both print, broadcast, and online, by by being kind of a distraction for people. That uh, the digital culture, in my opinion, has given the audience, the public, so many choices that I think they're in flight to a certain extent, that people are saying, I can't cope, Uh, it's too much, I'm going to watch cat videos. And I think that the effect that that has had, including uh, Craig Newmark and others who have taken advertising dollars away from uh, more traditional media sources, and has left uh, the media landscape in Canada in a very dangerous place right now. So the government in its wisdom said, well, we're gonna help you. And what they've said is that we're going to ask the big media aggregators like Google and Facebook and Instagram to cough up some money to support journalism in Canada. It's a noble idea, but it comes with consequences. And I think we're just kind of trying to figure out how those consequences will affect how we conceive media, how we perceive it, how we co- how we distribute it, and how we consume it. And the other issue that is still people are trying to get their heads around is 
what is the proper role of government when it comes to journalism? Okay, well, we'll and, get into that a little bit later, but I just yeah. wanted to bring Yoni in about this point. So Yoni, come on in and talk a bit about how that looked like. What did that look like for you at the CJN over the years? I think uh, it's clear that all media has been affected by Google's ubiquity and the way people, certainly of a certain generation, use Facebook and Instagram. Uh, there's no question about that. And ad revenues have been sucked away uh, for closing in on a decade now. The other side of this conversation is how media companies reacted to the emergence of Google and Facebook and really, in, in a lot of cases, sort of laid their cards out to try and reap the benefits of that. You know, thinking for years that if you search engine optimized your content and you wrote headlines a certain way and you kept up with various changes in the algorithms, that you could actually make money and be successful by playing into Google's hands. And, you know, this is notwithstanding the whole idea of, you know, making all content that people used to pay for in a newspaper free online in, in many cases. So, you know, there is there is that other side of the story where, you know, the media kind of threw in their lot with this thing without really paying too much heed to, to the long game of how that might affect them uh, eventually. Who was pressuring the government to do something? There has been pressure from the large media organizations who are ironically in a position where they don't need the money as much as community newspapers and regional outlets. CBC would be a big beneficiary of getting money from uh, Google and Facebook at a time when there's pressure on the CBC. So it's a, it's a complicated environment for which there are no easy answers. Yeah, and smaller um, smaller outlets and uh, ethnic and community outlets are uh, offering some pushback, and I think there will be more coming. Some of the organizations that represent these sorts of media um, are have have already spoken out against the bill and will be continuing to sort of consolidate their efforts to do so. Because uh, they're going to be the ones shut out from this largesse if Facebook meta and Google have to pay a link, a link tax, is what they call it, for use of uh, the links to, to our stories. Yeah, exactly. Google and Facebook in the last 12 months have had an increase in about 300% in income, whereas uh, other media organizations have lost money. So it's really, it's an, it looks easy to say to, to these large behemoths, um, you know, help us out here. And as in Australia and in Europe, they're probably going to do something in that regard, but they're going to they're going to play hardball for the next few months. This hardball means what to our listeners, our viewers, niche, as well as mainstream Canadians? Where will they get Canadian news from? Jeffrey Start and then and Yoni. It's still possible to get news by going online to uh, Canadian Jewish News or to the Globe and Mail and subscribing and then you will get the news what the the big players have done is that they've made it easy and cheap for the public not to have to think about these things or to spend the money the problem is from my perspective is that money comes always with strings attached there's no free lunch um, and there certainly is no free lunch in in media terms what we're seeing now is because of the hollowing out of the ability of news organizations to do the same job they did even 10 years ago, media organizations are saying, okay, we're going to provide the audience with more something with fewer resources. So they're going to fire people, and now they're going to go AI, all that sort of thing. The problem is, is that there's no incentive for these large media organizations to do a better job. Get, getting free money from the government uh, means that they're being rewarded for mediocrity, in my opinion. And I think that this is going to be the big problem. Now, if the government does what the government usually does and say, OK, we'll give you the money. But here in exchange, you have to do more stories on our agenda, whether it's issues around indigeneity or gender issues or trans issues. And already we're seeing the uh, Department of uh, Canadian Heritage uh, say suggesting that it would be really nice 
if the big uh, media companies did more that supported the government's initiatives. Um, and as Pierre Trudeau once said, the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation. I'm coming around to the idea that the state has no business in the newsrooms of the nation. I agree with Jeffrey that I don't think the doomsday scenario will will actually come about. And there are examples, uh, like you said, in Australia and Europe where agreements have been reached even after some difficult negotiations. I think this is all part of um, political maneuverings. It's going to be a protracted battle. That said, I think every media organization should be planning right now for it to come to fruition. So in full disclosure, a lot of journalism organizations get money from the local journalism initiative that the liberals pro um, rolled out for the last four and a half years. I think it expires soon, where they give money towards by, um, salaries to hire journalists. Yeah, I mean, another aspect of the um, of uh, government funding that the CJN has certainly benefited from uh, is the uh, the legislation that was put in a couple of years ago, uh, allowing outlets to apply to become a registered journalism. Uh, I think it was the registered journalism initiative or whatever the exact name was. When we restarted the CJN for the about the first two for the first two year, years in a bit, we ran you know on ad revenue alone, and in the last six months or so since our application for that initiative was passed, we've been able to start fundraising, and while we're still a nonprofit, we're able to issue tax receipts to people uh, who will donate money to us. So that that's a big game changer for uh, small media and ethnic media, and I know. There are only a handful who have been approved so far, but there are certainly more out there that are looking to get approved. Uh, I see this as a, a, a safer way to uh, have government involved in funding media because it still puts the onus on media organizations to go out and do their own fundraising. But yeah, I mean, once you sort of break into that realm where you're getting money from people to do your work in a direct subscription model... It comes with a whole world of, of new obligations to, first of all, keep people apprised of your business model, and second of all, to uh, allow people to understand who's donating and when they're donating and what that actually means to the health and future of your organization. And one of the things that uh, I've been working on with a few others is to figure out a way that the CBC could be a non-commercial enterprise living for, say, a five-year period on a government grant, but then gradually, this is a lot, this is more wishful thinking than anything else, gradually going to an NPR model, which is to say, if you like what you've heard and seen, you could send us 50 bucks. Uh, I want to have a telethon, CJN telethon, with really great music at the end of the, every summer, and we can watch it. It would be awesome. I would definitely man the phones. And and it, it actually is a way of creating community. It's going to take a big uh, cultural shift in Canada to get to that, but I sense it's it's starting already, and I, I, I'm really pleased to see that... Uh, uh, CJN is doing some of that. What would you suggest people do to hedge, uh, make sure they do get Canadian diverse views? So I think what Jeffrey said, first of all, you know, getting people to subscribe, uh, and we've had done some of this over uh, the last couple of weeks, trying to really impress on people the importance of signing up for a newsletter uh, so that you're getting the news and you're getting around the, you're getting around having to go to Google, you're getting it right to your inbox subscribing to podcasts, whatever podcast you listen to from the CJN. And then I think there's a bigger thing here where quite literally all media organizations, big and small, are going to have to really work to change the behaviors of consumers who have become so used to, you know, just going to Google and finding what they want. Where you get your news is important. And it's up to you to figure out who the media are that you trust. And then to make a habit on a daily basis of bookmarking the CJN.ca uh, uh, or, or whoever and making a point of as part of your day and as part of your sort of ongoing education about Canadian life to go to those websites and read and read what's happening there. Now, this is sort of like the way the Internet was 10 years ago. You might even say it's um, 
it's sort of like having a newspaper subscription, as crazy as that idea sounds in 2023. I wrote a book exactly about this called Trusting the News in a Digital Age. And the issue is, to me, in one word, verification. How do we know what we're receiving, what we're sharing is useful and valuable to us, first as citizens and secondly as consumers? By looking at a website and going to the bottom and seeing if there's a what about uh, or about us uh, drop down box, is there a way of contacting this news organization? Who is responsible? Where are they getting their money? The all reliable media organizations should make that available. And what I've told my students when I was at U of T is that if you don't see that, best not to trust it. That's why you have this uh, tsunami of misinformation and disinformation, because people can't be bothered. And we have to figure out a way to help them be bothered. Before we end, I want to pick up what, what you mentioned about we know our audiences. But I, I understood that under Bill C-18, only news out, outlets that offer general news coverage are going to qualify for money, not niche or specialty papers. So in other words, the failed legacy media is going to get almost all of this money unless the, the ethnic media team up and become sort of a unified voice. So why reward people who didn't see a way out years ago and pivot and are just stripping the assets to feed their shareholders? I think that's exactly right. Now, the government should not be deciding who, who merits uh, their money and who does not. And I think that we're in a very, and at the same time, the Tories are saying defund the CBC and, and uh, let the marketplace decide. So media organizations like yours uh, are really being squeezed right now. And, and uh, uh, if I may offer some pro bono advice, you need to, you need to let the government know that this is, this is not the way to proceed and that this is, can be more damaging uh, to independent journalism at every level than anything else. There, and I won't even send you a bill. <laughs> you know, in an ideal world, it would be nice also perhaps to be able to say, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily need that money, especially if we can continue our donor models. That's not to say that if, you know, that if we can qualify for money from the government that we would turn it down of course but um you know i think as the sort of the bill uh continues forward and the negotiations continue forward there's going to have to be various considerations for all different sizes of of media to figure out where exactly it you know where exactly their best next step is <laughs> Paul Godfrey was founder and CEO and most recently executive chairman of Post Media Network. It's still the largest newspaper chain in Canada. Godfrey explains why Bill C-18 is the best answer for big publishers and why his company pushed for it. Well, it's, uh, back in 2012, we recognized that Google and Facebook and uh, many of the other um, major companies in the uh, United States we're coming in, taking our content, not paying for it at all, uh, not, a, not uh, really obeying the, um, the, the rules in Canada, even though the rules weren't enforced. And uh, they didn't uh, create any employment in Canada. They made millions and millions of dollars each and every year. And uh, now they like it so much, they don't want to change it. And I can totally understand why they don't want to change it, because they're, doing, they're going to put us out of business. And that's the reason why we've been fighting. And the fact is, uh, we watched our print advertising, which is our greatest form of revenue, uh, that came, uh, came into uh, the newspaper business. And uh, it slowly er er eroded. And where did it go? It went to a company in the uh, United States called Google and, and Facebook. And they refused to, uh, to pay any, anything for it. Now they've come around a little bit and paid a little bit amount. Uh, but they didn't want uh, Bill C-18 to come into place. Bill C-18 is, is called something else in Australia. It's called something else in France. But it set the rules up, which made it easier for us to bring legislation in. This government, um, thank goodness, finally came through. But governments move very, very slowly. So finally, they've come, we've come through with it. Now they're saying, well, we may pull out of Canada. We think it's unfair. 
What about all the unfairness in the last several years where they did nothing? Speaking about that, you mentioned just a minute ago that they did do some deals with about 18 Canadian publishers. We don't really know who all of them are because it's not public, but did uh, your group get a, an individual deal? with? Yes. The- that, that, well, here's what happened. that uh, uh, We tried to keep the group together because in, in numbers, you've got more strength. Uh, then uh, the Globe and Mail decided, well, we're going to make our own deal. And then the star followed and they said, they're going to make their own deal. Well, we found ourselves almost a lone wolf. So we made a deal as well because we needed every dollar we can get. But it's nowhere near going to save the Globe and Mail, the star or post media's uh, papers unless they're, they're really enforced in a way that keeps us alive. Bill 6C18 is at least a start of a new era. What was the amount that post media people got from, is it just Google or you also did it with Meta? Yeah, we did it. We did it with both. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I'm not at liberty to state amounts. Um, it is nowhere near what they should be dealing because they had us over a barrel. They said, this is what we're going to give you. And, but that was, that wasn't a, a good enough deal. So on that, what options do you see the federal government has to, to do to fight back or what do Canadians have to do in order to call their bluff or not call their bluff because they're obviously not bluffing? Well, yeah, they, well, maybe they are bluffing. Well, what have they done in, uh, in Australia? They backed off their position. What have they did in France? They backed off their position. They want, they're trying to use a big stick on Canada because we've been slow to get to the, uh, to the finish line. Are there any concerns that you have on the editorial sticking their nose into your newsroom business that they have the right under this bill? I'm not saying Google, I'm saying the feds to kind of figure out, well, who should get it? What kind of coverage? How does that sit in terms of uh, editorial independence? Some of our own reporters uh, thought that the government of Canada um, well, would have a say on what the columnists would write. Um, I didn't believe it. It hasn't happened to date, and I don't think it will happen. I think uh, that any legitimate uh, news uh, agency or uh, uh, company uh, would scream blue murder if uh, the government of Canada said, no, we want you to endorse us in the next election, or we want you to say this is what we want you to write about. It it won't work that way, and I think the government of Canada um, recognizes the only way of doing that is to appoint an independent board to oversee the progress that's been made and to indicate that if, if we're going to be a free democratic country, to advise the people of Canada what is good for the people of Canada, the star will probably take a, a left of center approach, we'll probably take a right of center approach, and it shouldn't be interfered by any political people at all. Or Google and Facebook decide who they're going to do private deals with, and then they decide who wins in well, the business, yeah, which is another possibility. They're not going to be allowed to do private deals uh, with us. They can they can try and can do a lot of things. They've gotten away with things for, for a long time. It was only recently that they came to the table only because they were threatened by the feds, and rightly threatened by the feds, that... Um, they had to make a deal and a deal had to be fair, a fair deal. You mentioned the Toronto Star, of course, and Post Media. So we need to talk about that. I, I still can't wrap my head around how the pro-Israel conservative uh, Post Media is going to be in the same bed as the liberal left leaning and well, maybe some pro-BDS columnists of the Toronto Star. First of all, no deal has been made yet. We're in the discussion stage at this point in time. We hope we can make a deal. Uh, We have been thinking that this had to be done a few years back, and it hasn't been done because the the, uh, comments of the Toronto Star were different from Post Media and vice versa. They called you a cancer on journalism. That was the old administration, but I thought it was uh, directed by the uh, management uh, at uh, Torstar, the Toronto Star, at that, I remember that clearly. I, um, I basically, at that point in time, uh, I was livid. And uh, my immediate reaction was to want to take a shot 
right back at, at the start. I was given better advice by um, uh, some very smart people in Toronto. I got to tell you that there's no newspaper in Canada that support or no or whole organization that supports Israel uh, like post media. When you have a merger, if you have a merger... In past history of uh, operations, there have been newsroom closures and layoffs, and we fear this will happen again for the diversity of voices in Canadian media sources. Well, I think you first have to realize what's been happening for the last five or six years. Every newspaper, big or small, has laid off people. We are a lot less people, more than 50% of our our uh, writers, our, our, our uh, people in the uh, legal department, the, the uh, HR department have all been trimmed back. Newspapers aren't what they used to be. If we don't do anything, the law will be gone. It, I think everybody realizes that no deal means the, the end of newspapers in this country. I got to tell you, in sports or in business, what you do is you negotiate the, the best deal you can make for your side. And I got to tell you, there's got to be some consolidation in the industry. You know, there's not going to be newspapers like it used to be. How many, how much room is there, there for, for business news? How much new, for entertainment news? And everybody's looking to cut back. At least we've got a lot of things percolating uh, uh, at this point in time. We didn't have that a month ago. And finally, some of the things are happening in stride with each other. And hopefully we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through the discussions with the star. And if we can do something that uh, we work together by keeping the editorial departments separate, then you, at least you got two different opinions being given to the people of Canada. Most people get their news by scrolling through Facebook. Or if you pay for a subscription, like of course I do, you go to the app and you read it. Sure. But most Canadians are lazy and they don't pay for their news. Right. So what I'm saying is, where should they go and what should people do when Facebook's going to block them? Like they already started blocking the Canadian Jewish News daily. Uh, two, three weeks ago, we are not able to be on. There's, there's, there's lots of sources for the news. Yeah, Apple News is, is still available online and, and provides a very good thing. And we're working with Apple News. And so is all the rest of the newspapers working for the analysts. They're not, they're not using a sledgehammer uh, on us because I think they understand the importance of, of the journalism. If we get to the point where we can't make a deal, you know, a pox on all our houses because we have to make a deal. Well, I think most media people who started out in the inter internet world didn't understand what giving away the news for free meant because it changed the way the model of the business yes, worked. And now it's kind of um, too late, you know, the cat's out of the bag or whatever, the horse has left the barn, whatever you do. So new models, new, new models have to come up, independent models, different models. You guys have tried it. New York News is really one on the um, circulation aspect because they're an international paper and everybody wants to read either the yeah. um, New York Times, the Washington Times of Israel, the Guardian, they've all succeeded New York Times as well. But they have great content and investigative journalism that people, they have a product that people want. We had much better content in the past, but we had to let a lot of it go because of what we are. We're not the New York Times because we happen to live in an environment that uh, uh, doesn't have that population around. Or Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. And we'll end with a mazel tov for Professor Erwin Kotler, Canada's special envoy on combating anti-Semitism and on Holocaust remembrance. He just won Israel's Presidential Medal of Honor for his contributions to Israel and the Jewish people. Thanks for listening to the CJN Daily. 